This is the Marketing Hero Podcast by ClearPivot, turning marketers into heroes. Welcome to the Marketing Hero Podcast. I'm your host, Maya Morgan-Wells, and in this episode, we are giving you a rare glimpse into an area of SaaS development that marketers don't normally see, especially on larger teams or for larger solutions. Product and marketing tend to be siloed. And in this episode, we are thinking about some of the ways that that separation can be detrimental in the long run. To help us frame this very important discussion about product and marketing, we've got a really special guest for you. He's got a rare combination of experience in the UX design and marketing that brings such a great perspective to the topic. Vince Plummer, welcome to the show, man. Absolutely. So let me start off with a question that we like to ask all of our guests. What's your favorite part of what you do and how did you figure that out? So, um... Well, so I primarily work now. I'm a senior UX designer, UX UI designer, and I kind of got there through marketing. Um, I started, I started uh, in digital marketing, and um, I would watch a lot of, um, I would watch a lot of marketing dollars be spent to drive, let's just say, fish in the net, and then I would watch the holes in the net lose the fish. And it led me to ask a lot of the questions about like what was missing inside of digital product or or software and uh, where were the holes and making sure that that type of thing, um, you know, you spend so much time on the hype and the focus on getting people there. And then it's like, once they're there, why are they churning, you know? And so that started, that led me to go into a bunch of meetups on UX. and, um, And once I realized that like, I, you know, this important thing around interviewing users and, and, uh, and seeing how they felt about it, you know, was really where I felt like my sweet spot was, was trying to design products for users, specifically informed by users so that companies don't waste a lot of money. And that happened in a, in a, a soft, um, a startup that I was a co-founder of in LA back in the day. And so, you know, we'd spend all, you know, startups don't have a lot of money. So when they, when they do, when they spend all this money, you want to make sure that your, your product is sticky enough that people are, you know, hanging around and using it. So, yeah. So my favorite part of the job is um, I'd say just like team designing, you know, a lot of times I think people think of design as this like siloed thing that happens, but like really great design comes from the information both internally and externally with a team. And uh, so I love, I love working on that stuff with people. Uh, um, Yeah. That's my favorite part of the job. And do you normally find yourself working with people from marketing teams in that way? When you're talking about working as a team, is that normally a product team that's separated from marketing or do you, do you normally see marketing people as part of that conversation? Um, they should be there. A lot of times they are not, you know, like, or really great marketers want to be involved in, and be a part of it, I think. But sometimes mm-hmm. I think that it's easy for in a company where they're, they're, you know, marketing has their focus and product has their focus, but great products come from like, you know, all, all of those people working together. Um, especially brand new features. Like it, it just helps everybody if you can fully understand it. And I, and I don't even think it's just marketing. I think it's like product engineering, marketing and design all working together. Um, that stuff leads to just making better products because everybody's got a different lens at which to look at the, the value proposition. So, mm-hmm. And it, it does sound like you're saying among all of that, the customer needs to remain central in that entire process. And I feel like, I mean, at least in the job description, marketers are really the ones in charge of that. Of course, sales on the other end, but you're trying to bring in a particular buyer persona or customer persona. And that's, you know, marketers are just, that's drilled into our heads from birth. It's like, do your customer persona first. 
and test, you know, test your product and make sure there's an audience and a product market fit really before you're doing anything else. And so it does make sense that you would, you would say, you know, um, in a perfect world, marketers would be a, a really integral part of that product discussion. Mm-hmm. Um, do you feel like that's, that's one of the most important ways, you know, UX and marketing are linked or how else are they linked other than really that focus on the customer? How else should they be linked together? Well, so there's, there's also the, there's also the exploration part of this where you're, you're trying to find out what, um, what might work. And, and so like how I've worked pretty closely in the past is like, let's say you're floating ideas or you're floating feature ideas and uh, working with marketing, running smoke tests, running uh, landing page, you know, sending traffic to a landing page. I've done the type of thing where I've designed the landing page or worked with marketing on the landing page and making sure that all those things are kind of linked up. Sometimes I end up playing both roles there, but um there's, there's the, there's just really defining the persona up front and making sure that all, so it's like when you know what you know, and then there's when you don't know what you know. And I think that there's a, an opportunity for, for that relationship on both ends. Yeah, that's really, does smart. that make sense? Yeah, that does. It, it okay. does. It, it, what are some examples of, do you think, I mean, I don't know if you want to talk out of school or share any name, name, any names, but has there been a breakdown that you think has affected either the success of one or the other that you can point to as an example, um, you know, either where marketing doesn't really understand the product or, you know, I don't know, you've worked very hard on a, on a UX endeavor that then marketing messes up somehow. Do you have, um, what can, what, how can this go wrong? (laughs) Well, I never, yeah, I'd never name names, but, uh, (laughs) what I have seen where I feel like when marketing's and, and I don't think it's like, one particular, you know, group's fault. Like it has to be baked into the culture that everybody kind of gets together and works together because everybody is like marketing's got to push the message and push the product. And so like, if they're pushing something that feels disjointed, it's, you know, it's, it's a problem. So um, I have seen examples where marketing will, let's say, come up with branding ideas and those ideas were done in a in a in a silo, and and those certain the visual language doesn't compute to what can actually end up being in product. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So, like like yeah. let's say you have a design system, and and that design system has a certain palette of colors or or certain iconography, and um, you have to either as an organization be committed to um, looking at your design system as not something that you're just borrowing from somewhere else, but like if you're committed to having your own design, your own look and feel, because like, let's face it, like you're committing or you're, you're competing against products that are starting to think more like consumer products than SaaS products. And because people spend all day on consumer products, right? So like the products that look and feel like and, and, you know, interact in a, in a consumer type of way are going to be the products that people enjoy using the most. Right. Makes um, sense. So like, let's say marketing comes up with this great, you know, certain iconography or certain, you know, color palettes or something like that. And they don't jive with what the product actually looks like. Then I feel like that's a massive, you know, that's a big miss, you know? And so mm-hmm. those types of conversations, I think, when when talking about like what the product could look like and what you're going to then market to people those two things should be you know in harmony and when they're not what you'll find is marketing ends up having to dress up what the product looks like in their in their photos or for their ads or something like that and then people get into the product and they're like this doesn't look like what i clicked on in an ad or you know what i mean so that to me has been and I've seen that multiple times where it, it's very easy for marketing to get into its silo and just be thinking about that part. But if they're not, if they're not working together, you know, and lockstep with lockstep, is that the, and lock yeah, I think step? I've heard that. Yeah, lock, if they're, yeah, not, lock work, step, if they're lock not lockstep. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> if they're not working together with product on right. that thing, then there's a miss. 
Um, mm-hmm. So that's been the main thing. Um, and what's the result when, so, cause you're, you're a big UX guy. So you, you're thinking about the experience that that user's having. Um, and that was really smart. I think what you said about the consumer experience really bleeding into our expectations for SaaS. What do you think either that psychology or just in general, once you do, let's say, land on a disjointed sort of experience from an ad or, you know, maybe even a a feature was described in a certain way and that's not exactly how it works. What's the result of that experience, that user experience? Do they immediately leave? Well, so they quit the trial. I mean, what's, what's the, the result? I always, I always like to use this. I always like to use this. um, I always like to use this example as something that I've, that I, that I've loved about using certain consumer products. So like, you remember like the Twitter fail whale, like when, when Twitter would fail, there'd be like that picture of the whale and like little Twitter, Twitter birds flying away. Right. Mm -hmm. I do remember that. All right. Or like Google's, you know, like, so if you think of like 404 pages or, or, um, you know, areas where there are opportunities for marketing to have so much more influence of brand in the product. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. if you, if if there's not, if there are all those holes, then, then those little moments of delightful, you know, I mean, and, and like, 404 messages or error messages, like page doesn't exist, like that type of stuff isn't exactly a delightful experience. But if you can have something that feels cute and fun or that's on brand, um, error messages, there's opportunities. So another example is like, let's say you're using a third party tool like Pindo and Pindo allows for, well, okay. So if you think about the, the, the product lifecycle and then you've got engineering that's you know focusing on developing or implementing, you know, design coming from product or design coming from, you know, UX or something like that. Like their folk, like that tech ends up living for a long period of time. And so sometimes little opportunities for marketing don't don't make it into that tech stack that might live for 10 years on a, you know, on very because depending upon what packages that people install, and sometimes they don't want to upgrade to new packages, so they're on old packages, um, depending upon like what you know, all the different components that might make software fail. So people are leery about upgrading to new versions of things. Um, and, and so like, let's say that that happens. Well, marketing has this opportunity with tools like Pindo to be involved with UX on, on how to implement like in-app messaging, you know, or um, help, you know, things that would link out to like support documentation or something like that. Like all those things can be working together so that the, the, the product is on brand. Um, so oftentimes it's, you know, it might not be something that happens, but it's an opportunity for marketing to be involved in the product, um, in product. And um, another opportunity where, I, where there are misses for, uh, for marketing is like, let's say marketing just hands me a bunch of icons, you know, do those icons, are, do those icons reduce to small levels? Like, what if I want to turn that particular, let's, let's say that there's, that icon is supposed to represent a product in a product suite. Does that icon, has that icon been thought about at Like what that would look like if I turn that icon into a button, you know, like, like, it's yeah there's a lot of just things with like buttons and iconography and product level messaging where marketing can be more involved so that everything feels more cohesive because otherwise you end up with a lot of default looking stuff and and you could scan your site and realize if you you'd be horrified to find out how many colors are actually in a site or in a product where you're like that's not the red that we use and then there's you know 20 different shades of red in the CSS, you know? So Mm -hmm. there's all these moments. um, And I think that a lot of these moments could just be solved by better relationships with product, you know? Um, And not just thinking that they only own the message in marketing, but just overall look and feel should be thought about at a more holistic level than a, a up top, just sending out ads type of level or just sending out ads and messaging and 
brochures and all that type of stuff. Like it's, it's way deeper than that when it comes to identity. So. Well, right. Because the user is experiencing that brand as a whole. They're not differentiating between what they're seeing in a Facebook ad versus an ad that they saw on LinkedIn versus the actual product versus the company's website or the email they might've received. All they're noticing is that it feels disjointed and they may not see that, you know, the difference in hex code of two different reds, but um, they, they may start to psychologically feel that, that yeah. disjointed experience. Um, do you feel like these design differences are partly because of differences in intent? So meaning, you know, marketing is wanting to push the message out there, grab some leads, you know, product is, you know, has a different, has a different, um, you know, goal in mind. Do you feel like those are maybe reasons why these things get disjointed? What about the- Well, the yeah, I, it's, it's intent. It's like one person doing- you know, two people's jobs, it's, you know, people coming and going um, that have a certain amount of domain expertise, you know, in an organization, like all these types of things happen in a professional world. Um, human, just like natural, the natural effect of just humans being too busy and trying to take care of their, the, the task at hand, which is why I think that it actually has to be something that's implemented from like I, I would see that this is like kind of the job to be discussed at, at an executive level because the executive set the set the, the, the culture. So it's like it's it's having the chief marketing officer be um be in lockstep with the chief product officer and 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 making and 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 you know and the chief uh, the chief tech technology officer to make sure that all of those things are kind of being implemented and mm -hmm. that there's the right amount of head count. And, um, <laughs> but you know, it's like those things are those things. I, and I think sometimes too, it, it, it happens just because you're trying to deliver feature because the features are the things that sell. And so sometimes this stuff becomes an afterthought, but when it, is, when it, when it does work, you know, if you think of like products that are beautiful, it's because those things are in harmony. You know, those, um, I think of like Square or like Uber or, um, you know, like a lot of consumer, like Robinhood, you know, mm -hmm. like some of these consumer facing apps, like their apps are beautiful. And you know that the market, like marketing and or I would like to think, or, you know, um, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of times it's consumer facing products that touch enterprise, I feel like where the, the products that are beautiful, they just, they sell more, you know? Well, it provides um, this better experience, really. I mean, and like you said before, we're all expecting that. We have really high standards for our SaaS right. these days. Um, yeah, I mean, nothing really kills that experience faster than something that feels ugly or clunky, you know, or hard to get around. Well, and, and the thing is, is like, I think the other reason why it, it, it happens is, like, let's say you've got executives choosing to, to buy a certain software, like employees are going to use that software, regardless of what it looks like, I think a lot of times, but having employees be evangelists for certain software um, also goes a long way too, because then they can recommend it to people when it's time to choose what type of software you're going mm -hmm. to use. You know? um, mm -hmm. and, they, and that's how you would end up with these, you know, like, they're paying forty thousand dollars a month for this particular enterprise soft level software or whatever the recurring monthly revenue is. Um, sometimes that comes from recommendations from employees down up, but like, you know, sometimes it comes from a, I don't know. It, it however it gets there. If it looks great and it feels great and it and it's there's cohesion around, I feel like that stuff all ultimately gets more recommendations from the employees that want to actually use that software. And then once yeah, you start okay. using that software, then you're into that software cycle, especially if they become an integral part of your business, you know, and you're connected to APIs and things like that. Once you're using that software, you could be using that software for 10 years, you know? So yeah. I don't know. So it's important. So it's, important. it's definitely an important conversation. So 
on a practical level, do you have any ideas on how that is actually implemented and achieved? Because you started talking about um, really that top-down executive level conversation and alignment between technology, product, and marketing, um, you know, at, at really the brand-wide level. Like let's let's really be cohesive with this. Um, so that's definitely a great place to start. As a senior UX designer that does this every single day. Do you see yourself having time and space and availability to work with marketing people? Um, should there be, you know, I don't know, pods or teams that that get formed around particular initiatives that include people from all those different teams? I mean, even customer service is a great, you know, uh, person to bring into the conversation because they have those direct conversations with users sure. about their experiences. So, I mean, you know, is that one idea to do it? How does it actually get achieved? And do you even have time as a busy UX person? to incorporate that, um, just on your daily basis? Well, it depends. It de so I think that it has to happen first by being determined up top that it's an actual important thing. And it can't just be important from with like lip service. Like it has to be baked into the culture where like, okay, what can we do about it? And do we have the right amount of head count so that it can happen? And I think a, a lot of times it's head, headcount determines a lot of that stuff and making sure that it's it's like being directed from the top that like this is an important thing that needs to happen i want you to report back to me on how this is happening um it can't just be things that are being kind of reported on in the silo it, it like i think you know weekly bi-weekly types of meetings where making sure that everything is kind of you know um yeah, where everything is kind of being discussed on that type of level, but it also like having marketing involved in like things that UX can do is have marketing involved in sprints, you know? So like if you're running a sprint in a meeting or if you're running a sprint on new features, making sure that marketing participates and then marketing has to be willing to participate, right? And then like inviting UX to meetings specifically when it comes to here's what we're thinking for new branding, here's what we're thinking for this, how how could that fit inside a product? You know, because if you just hand UX a bunch of uh, new design colors and typography, it's like, what if that typography doesn't work inside a product? You know, like mm -hmm. those things can be like, th those things can be discussed at sooner rather than later. Because sometimes they outsource that information or they outsource that stuff to marketing agencies for other SaaS companies. Like sometimes they do that stuff in house and sometimes they will outsource it to marketing agencies that will then come back and all of a sudden deliver what your new product is supposed to look and feel like. And you're like, whoa, nobody talked to UX about this particular <laughs> thing. You know, right. like how right. that how that's actually supposed to be implemented here and then like, what are the guidelines? And I think a lot of that can, say, you know, save you from even having to go back to the agency who's gonna charge you an arm and a leg to develop, to, you know, to give you your brand guidelines. It's like, there are some things that could just happen from a few meetings, I think internally. Mm -hmm. So Yeah. And that's a, that's a good, it's an important point to think about agencies as well, because, you know, definitely a lot of SaaS founders out there or even, you know, large enterprise level SaaS companies hire out agencies for certain things. Um, yeah. And then that puts a whole other layer on it of people that really don't get product and this is coming, I'm an agency person, so I'm not, I'm not throwing anybody under the bus other than myself here, but you know, I know that even as somebody who is steeped in SaaS marketing every single day, I don't know a whole lot about UX and product design and development. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show, because I think it's really important for, for people like me that are working in marketing. We're concerned about SEO value. We're concerned about, you know, content and our plans for, you know, lead nurturing and marketing automation. And that's a lot of things that we have on our plates, just like you guys have a ton of things on your plates. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I definitely think that that just that philosophical approach to what we're both doing, because the goal is the same for both of us. The goal is the same as to provide that amazing experience that delights that customer into, you know, a lifetime of MRR for us. Um, so, so yeah, I definitely think this, this conversation is hugely important. Um, and that most marketers don't understand enough about what goes into product and UX. I mean, even to the point of, you know, I've worked with branding agencies before 
um, you know, trying to develop new branding, let's say for a website, but when I get the fonts back, it's, it's really for print. So right. it's really, is it even those tiny things, those disconnects that happen on that level is like, that doesn't even involve a, a SaaS product. So I can see how there's 20 different reds in the CSS after all these people have their hands on it. Like um, a, a serif font, a sans serif font, like there are certain things that won't even show up for most users, depending upon the platform that they're, you know, accessing things. Then you have to mm-hmm. also, here's the other part of it. You have to also consider accessibility. So like companies can be sued for not being accessible. So right. if, if the color palette is completely and totally off from like what could be implemented inside of, you know, th- like not thinking about it from an accessible place or like what are our options for accessibility? And, and now that's more on UX's side where we have to interpret that, but starting from that place makes it easier for us to interpret, you know? Um, and I would say that like messaging the messaging opportunities between UX and product and, and marketing like can live with those third-party in-app messaging types of things with like Pendo um, mm-hmm. and anything that directs out towards support documentation. It's like marketing should be in lockstep that they don't have support documentation that doesn't look like that's completely and totally off brand, which I've seen, I've seen that before mm-hmm. too. So there's a lot of ways of marketing can be touching product, but it just kind of, you know, it just takes those types of conversations. It takes a concerted effort, I think is what it, what it's sounding like. Does. Yeah. Um, well, this is a, that's a very interesting conversation. I think for anybody working on either side of that is really just to kind of take this as a way of thinking about how we're both doing our jobs and both, and both working towards that same goal together. Um, so thank you for the insights in that. Um, I don't know that there's really one solution other than, you know, setting policy and enforcing policy, at least within big organizations. Um, and then, you know, it sounds like in the startup environment, it's really, you know, those, those, all those people that need to be involved, it may, maybe one person, it may be two or three people, um, that are all doing all of that. So really in that case, it's just a matter of understanding the intersections between these two things and how important they are. Yeah. Uh, I loved your fishing net metaphor. What was that? Tell us that, that again, well, one just, more time. Just like <laughs> I, I, I have seen large marketing campaigns drive a bunch of, um, drive a bunch of, you know, fish to, to the net. And then there's a hole in the net and it's like, why is why you know and then the question is like well what what we, we got all these new users it's like yeah but they just because you get new users don't mean that they stay so it's important mm-hmm. to understand why they're leaving you know and um yeah that's the hole in the net yeah I mean, that's really important to think about all of the different phases of that flywheel. We call it a flywheel where, you know, you're attracting the new users in um, first as leads, then you're converting them into the product or the free trial. And I love what you're saying about in-app messaging, um, even support documentation, knowledge bases. Um, you know, we've, we can link a couple of articles here in the show notes because um, we have written a lot about that and how it, it is product kind of is a marketing endeavor. Uh, and vice versa. And so definitely needing for all of us to work together a little bit more closely. Totally. Uh, before we get going though, Vince, I I, ha- I saw a little something on Instagram that I wanted to ask you about. Now this is away from the, <laughs> away from the UX and the SaaS conversation, but I saw, I saw a little something on there. It's, it sounds like you recently released some music. Do you want to tell us about that here on the Marketing Hero? Yeah, sure. So, and I should say that I, I basically, like I came to marketing like i i kind of started off honestly if i link it all back to how i landed a career in tech like it all started from band posters and trying to promote shows right so like i would i learned those design tools and then um and then i had to figure out other social media platforms to try to drive people towards either buying tickets or buying you know, back then it was CDs, but like, you know, buying, buying music or consuming music. Um, so yeah, uh, I re- recently released, um, this would be like my ninth album or something. Um, but it was my third album under the name Plum Charlie is that I'm releasing now. And um, yeah, so that was uh, also kind of like a fun little digital marketing experiment of, you know, running, uh, creating the music and then making a music video and then taking various segments of that music video and creating different micro 
uh, micro ads. So for Instagram stories, so like I make a 15 second Instagram story, you know, and Facebook story and like those would run inside of Facebook. And then they all drove them towards one particular landing page that I had installed a Facebook pixel so that, you know, you can retarget those people after you uh, run various campaigns. So, so even, yeah. even with this music that you're making for fun at home, you're, you've got that marketing, you got that digital marketing cap on still. To this no, day. I mean, well, because you, <laughs> you have to think about it. It's like, you've got these people that spend an exorbitant amount of time making music, music, you know, you spend all this time doing it. And if you think that it's just, I mean, because music has been largely devalued, you know, like, I mean, although platforms like Spotify and things like that are great, like you don't make the, the amount of money that you would make, you know, um, nearly that, you know, from well, selling like a $10 CD, you know, or yeah, 15. totally. And it's like, and people don't have the attention anymore because there's more of it. So like it, the barrier to entry is lower. Um, and so, I mean, there's oppor- there's like high opportunities for a small group of people. And then like a lot of people, there's, there's not as much. So the more things that you can do, honestly, I don't even, I don't even really know how you could think about releasing music and not think about um the visual component of every single little thing and how Mm -hmm. you could take one large if you think about it like gary vaynerchuk right it's like you take that one large piece of you know content and you chop it up a bunch all these different ways and you make it platform specific you know so you can take one thing and you know i think i was trying to make turn like one thing into 20 different small things and then you test you a b those together to see like what performs better and then you turn off that ad if it doesn't and run the other ad um yeah I and mean, it's just a it's just a slog after that regular <laughs> well, and so, and, uh, so you were telling me before that you got some radio play out of this and you think maybe it was the ads yeah Tell us about that Tell us i woke about up that. i woke up uh yesterday morning and um, there was a, I was pinged from some radio show in Brighton and I was running Brighton, in England. We yeah. In, in the UK, yeah. Stuff. Yeah. Okay. I was, I was yeah. pinged from some radio show in Brighton and now I don't know a hundred percent if that's how, but he, he said he, you know, that he, he like took, they took the song and it was like, I didn't even submit it to that station. They just took it and they put it on. And they were kind of talking about it and, and joking about me being a dad rapper. And um, okay, and, and so that's yeah. a new genre for us. Um, yeah. What what song was it that they played? The circles and squares one with my kid. That okay. my, cause we made that music video. My kid and I during lockdown, we just I got out a green screen and I was like, I'm gonna learn how to do green screen, and um, and I'm gonna like brush up on my chops on Adobe Premiere. Do you have, can you give us a little bit of this dad rap at, to take us out for the episode? Yeah, let me see. Hold on. Son, dad's back with a dad rap and a black cap because his head's up. Still cool to the preschool, no fool. One day you'll think pops up. Square. So I read rhymes to you with bedtime line by line, how the moons up. Then I grind till I get mine in the basement, making bigger, bigger beats on a square. All night till the stands right. If I don't write, then I don't get to press that. That light when it stays white. When it's not red, then you'll never see proper times. Young pup, when you wake up, when the moon's down, when the sun's up, the sun's up. Cereal in your bowl from the box of boxes. We don't know.